Yo. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to part two of the Linkara Retrospective. If you didn't see part one, we covered the first ever piece of media Linkara or Lewis ever created, a novel by the name of Angel Armor, Just a Boy, of which he wrote when he was only 14 years old. Today, however, we're going to be taking a look at the sequel to that original novel, to see not only what happens next in his grand epic, but also to see if there are any more weird a bizarre sorts of content to be found there within. Or if he actually evolved a bit as a writer as he got older and continued to write. The other two books should be coming out really quickly after this video's release too, by the way, since I have since read all three of the sequels and written down my thoughts on them already. I should also note that, as I said before, I can't rag on these books seriously all that too much, since they were technically written by a teenager. And while yes, objectively they have many flaws, it is still technically impressive for a teen to finish writing, well, anything that isn't one of the many school papers that they've been assigned to them in teenage daycare. I mostly want to cover these because I've never seen anyone else cover them on YouTube, and I wanted to for the sake of completeness when looking at Lewis's stuff as well. But at the same time, get comfy my friends as we once again take a plunge into the world of angel armor. So, the second novel in Lewis's Angel Armor series is subtitled The Cassandra Conflict, published, according to Amazon, on February 15th, 2004, less than a year after the first novel was published. According to the description on the back of the novel, quote, Right after the events of Just a Boy, Lewis Williamson is flung into the distant past during an event known as the Hundred Year War. Determined to change the past to avoid the loss of so many lives, Lewis Lewis decides to try and change the course of the war to make it end sooner. However, his desire to do good will not be enough to stop him from going too far. Meanwhile, Endo and Lewis's other companions celebrate the final defeat of the darkness and mourn the loss of the Linkara. However, an old enemy arrives in town, deciding to resurrect the Dark Knights as the Eclipsed Legion. To counter this new threat, the group must now look to old friends and new ones in order to stop the Eclipsed Legion as well as rescue Lewis from the past. Also, White Raven is tempted by an offer to join this new order, and she accepts." Unquote. Yeah, with that being said, we jump into the actual contents of the book. We start with a prologue that just describes what happens in the previous book. All the novels from this point will have those, but I suppose I will read this one this one time since it also has some lead into the first chapter. Quote, My name is Lewis Williamson, and and I am in hell. All right, maybe hell is too strong a word for this sort of situation, but it's rather unpleasant. Okay, unpleasant is also too strong a word, so let me put it this way. As hells go, this ain't so bad. Currently, I am somewhere within the land of Keen, and being catered to my every whim and desire. Of course, with the heat and humidity of this desert country, the thing I want most is water and food. Don't see Keen on the map? Well, you shouldn't, considering that Keen isn't on Earth. It's located on the planet called Sin. Yeah, I know, it's a really dirty name for a planet. However, if you'll let me start from the beginning, you'll understand the predicament that I'm in." Unquote. He then begins to describe the events of the first book, 
yada yada yada, quote, unlike the typical whiny superhero who would start moaning and bitching about, oh how he wasn't ready for the responsibility, and that he just wished he could go home, I took it upon myself to go out and kick some ass. My journey throughout this strange land has been a long and adventurous one. I met with kings, fought alongside an army of light against the army of darkness, and even fell in love with a nice priestess girl who liked sleeping around. However, when it finally came time to fight the big bad evil dude, I had to sacrifice myself in order to save the planet and blah blah blah. And so, whatever happened to finally destroy the evil darkness thing has brought me here. I am in Keen, and although I'm being treated like I am royalty, with scantily clad women feeding me grapes and people on weird instruments playing funky music, I am no doubt in some deep layer of hell. Well, not really." Unquote. And so, with all that information out of the way, on to the main chapters. Chapter 1, After the Fire. This chapter is mainly about Indo mourning the Linkara being gone, as she obviously was in love with him, and thus his departure, or thought to be death, from their side is hitting her the most. Meanwhile, the Lewis or the Linkara, as noted in the prologue, travel back in time, in the world of Sin, somehow, but specifically in the sandy area in the Kingdom of Keen. Even though he single-handedly defeated a Terrafell Arbiter, aka a guy atop a dragon he beat at the end of the first book, in case you forgot, the King of Keen, Leonidas, doesn't like Lewis and doesn't believe him to be a Linkara, especially since they they have a very different religion in this region, and thus he is extremely suspect of the boy. In response to this, Lewis shows off how powerful and OP he is and is basically an unstoppable Chad by now, just flexing on the whole place after the king had a bunch of his guards attack him, and then were quickly knocked out by Linkara. Quote, If these were the guys who are fighting the Terrafell Arbiters, no wonder no one's ever slain a dragon rider, Lewis exclaimed. Leonidas glared at him, unquote. Then by chapter's end, we cut back to Endo and White Raven having a conversation. Raven tries to console Endo, but then Endo reveals that she still hates Raven because Raven killed her grandparents. And then Raven pushes Endo back, and reveals that she's also in pain that Lewis is dead, because he was also important to her as well, ending the chapter with both of them being rather upset. Chapter 2, Penumbra. So after Lewis clearly showcased that he was literally a god, King Leonidas decided to appoint Lewis as the new captain of his army. But this girl named Jordan wants to be the captain and has wanted to for some time, and so some conflict arises. Quote, a boy? They assigned a child to lead my unit, Jordan exclaimed. The other men in the group nodded. Jordan had a deep tan skin, which also somehow managed to stay smooth despite years of battle and hardship in the desert. She stood about 5'9", and her hair was long and a mixture of blonde and brown. Her clothes were that of a standard keen military outfit, consisting of loose cloth underneath a hard leather slash steel hybrid chest plate, light leather gauntlets, and metallic ankle armor. Most of the skin on her legs and arms were exposed, which was similar to the current fashion of the others. Jordan growled, her hand using a crude file to sharpen a large axe that she held in her arms. The others in the unit were laying down, sharpening the weapons as Jordan was, or swimming in their undergarments in the oasis pool. Worry not, Jordan. We still stand beside you should you challenge this fool, one of the men who was sharpening his weapons stated. There shall be no need for that. I intend to kill the impotent boy the moment he arrives. Jordan said, throwing the file away from her and gripping the handle of her axe. Ha! Then we shall have a good show for us before we... But before the soldier could continue, the group was shocked to see a pummeled mass of red scales and blood suddenly land in the middle of the mall. They all gasped and retreated from the object. Those close enough to their weapons grabbed them instantly. The black horns protruding from the bloody carcass made the unit realize what this thing was. It was the head of a dragon. For those of you who are still so retarded that they think I'm not serious about my job, allow me to introduce you to my little friend here. Those words had come from Lewis, who was now approaching the group. They all gasped in turn, seeing him walk towards them. He walked past a shocked Jordan and stood next 
to the dragon's head. He looked down at it briefly, then used his gauntlet-covered arm to pick it up and show it to the unit once more. This is a dragon! The Terrafell Arbiters don't have an unlimited supply of dragons, but frankly, one is enough to slay a hundred units, and therein lies the problem. If the Arbiters were to send a hundred Dragon Riders to Keen, not even the armies of Jilad and Keen combined would be able to stop them. Fortunately, we're catching a break. The Arbiters, after realizing from the last war how they moved too quickly in, in their attempt to seize new lands, are adopting a policy of slow conquest. They fight for yards instead of miles, because of that, the bulk of their forces are now focused on Keen and Jilad. They are, however, taking this time to also plan out a full invasion of Keen. And what are you dickheads doing instead of planning for war to end all wars? You're fucking swimming! Lewis exclaimed. How dare thee! This unit is one of the most battle-hearted in all of sin. What gives you the right to- Shut up, Leftant! Lewis growled. Jordan's eyes got wide, and she took a step back. For a brief moment, she saw a fire in Lewis's eyes that frightened her. However, she quickly regained her composure and took another step forward." Unquote. That's right. Lewis tells that bitch to shut the fuck up and puts her in her place. However, she's not so easily swayed by the Linkara's words. And so she steps up to challenge him, to which Lewis notes, Oh, very well. It would appear that I am destined to once again face stupid people, whether it be in the past or the present, he said. A fight between them then ensues, and ends on this note. Quote, Jordan decides to wait for the attack from Lewis, which came immediately. Lewis leapt off the ground, jumping higher than Jordan had ever seen someone go. While in midair, Lewis's other gauntlet formed up, and the second blade slid out. Out. Lewis came down at Jordan, one blade going in first and knocking the axe away from her, while he used the flat side of the other to slam against her face and send her flying to the side. She landed in a shallow pool, groaning in pain and anger. She tried to get up, but the injuries she had now sustained to her legs and back made the pain too much to fight. She sighed in frustration and lay back, clenching her teeth together. Lewis turned back towards the others, who had shocked looks upon their faces. Okay, he said. Who's next in line to be my biatch? Unquote. So, <laughs> yeah, that... That's pretty much that. Meanwhile, Endo is being gaslit into thinking that grieving over the Linkara is bad and shit by several other characters, and people seem to be getting actively upset that she's grieving over him, which comes off as really fucking mean and even outright emotionally brain dead because it seems like they're upset that she's upset about it at all. And all this only seems to make her feel even worse. However, amongst these emotions, she later thinks maybe that she should apologize to White Raven, since she actually did understand her pain. There is also talks of politics and the like in the kingdom going on, blah blah blah, you kind of get the idea. But by chapter's end, Mira, the pedophile rapist of cat girls, in case you forgot, shows up at the end of this chapter in Endo's, in Endo the cat girl's house. Uh oh. Chapter 3, Speculation. Thankfully, before we get more cat girl rape, White Raven comes in to save Endo from Mira, and they capture her for interrogation. Though, what's interesting is they actually could have just killed her right here and now, and as the story will progress, it kind of seems like they definitely should have just killed her right here and now, but whatever. All the same, Endo and White Raven now wonder who is controlling the Dark Knights now that the darkness is dead. Meanwhile, Lewis is still commanding the Keen unit, and of course, Jordan still doesn't like him at all. And so she tries to steal his gauntlet in the middle of the night while he's sleeping, seeing that it's what gives him his power. But it doesn't work out for her at all, and basically, he just wakes up up and she gets bitch slapped by Lewis. Chapter 4. What would Brian Botano do? Quote, You don't like me, do you, Leftant? Lewis asked. Well, Captain, allow me to explain it in a simple way. You are Linkaran, whereas I belong to the New Blood Order. You refuse to allow the troops to engage in the activities that made them proud to be a member of the Keen Army and this unit. You are pompous, arrogant, superior, and you think you're smarter than us. And if it appears at times that I don't like you, 
Well, that's just the reasons why, Jordan stated. Lewis walked over to one of the support poles of his tent and leaned against it. He closed his eyes and smirked, quickly opening them and stared at her. You're what people on my planet call a colossal bitch. You act as if you've got a shaft up your ass. You're lazy, sloppy, idiotic, and you think you know everything. You think it's unfair of me to push these soldiers to actually do their jobs? and ready themselves for combat, which they've seen very little of so far, in my opinion. And if it appears at times as if I don't like you, well, those are just some of the many reasons why. Lewis's smirk faded as he got in Jordan's face, narrowing his eyes at her. Let me be very clear, Jordan. I don't honestly give a damn if you think I'm the Linkara or not. I don't give a flying Fuck if you think I'm delusional. I could give a shit if you think I'm an elitist simply because I choose to act superior to my troops, despite the fact that my rank gives me full authority to be an asshole to them. All I care about, Jordan, is saving lives. And thanks to the little time travel venture I'm taking, I'll have the opportunity to do just that, unquote. So, uh, clearly Lewis isn't taking shit from no one in this book, which I suppose is consistent with his character for the first novel, but it seems even more extreme here. He knows he's the most powerful being in the world at this point, which of course would make one wonder if he's getting ready to be humbled by perhaps the new villains of this novel or something. Well, meanwhile, back in the normal time frame, Mir is captured and is imprisoned. And is being interrogated by General Javok, who has sort of been a character that's come up a couple times in the book, but mostly just to be there and also to to guilt trip uh, Indo into not feeling sad about the Linkara being gone. And so Mira has this whole speech about how much she loves torturing people and how she loves cutting guys nuts off. Quote, Have you ever just taken a prisoner of war and taken the time to slowly kill them? I have. There was one in particular, a farm boy from Anair. During the Dark Knight's rampage across the land, I had slain his parents when we took their house and food stores. The boy had seen me, and a few days later, attempted to take his revenge for his fallen loved ones. However, the boy's skills of a sword were limited and pathetic. I imprisoned the boy in his own home and slowly began my torture. I first cut off his fingers, one day at a time, while only feeding him life giver. Then I slowly sliced off his toes. I proceeded to then nail his fingerless hand to the wall with rusted nails. I then cut off his legs and scrotum in a period of one hour. By the time I was done, he was dead and trenched in his own blood. Although I took no pleasure at the time of it due to my lack of emotions, I took pride in my ability to keep such a young boy alive for so long despite all the things I was doing to him. He should have been there, General. You realize how much a person leads when you cut off their silence, Javok explained. Javok winced, realizing he was very disgusted by this woman and the stories he continually told while he had attempted to speak to her calmly and reasonably. He took in a deep breath and clenched his fists. Javok moved in closer to Mira, right outside the bars that held Mira in, unquote. I like how we get this little notation that Javok winced, realizing he was disgusted, as if the other thing winced wasn't already enough of a determiner and the whole story it's it, it's just kind of again stilted dialogue as per usual but moving on then out of nowhere two dark knights come in and beat javok the fuck up and then free their new dark queen and they decide to keep javok prisoner for now as a bit of a bargaining chip of sorts in the future. Really begs the question again though, why they didn't just kill Mira after all she had done, uh, but uh, you know, whatever. Anyway, we then cut back to Lewis's situation and he decides to have a heart to heart somewhat with Jordan and also gives her a history book from the future he brought with him to show her what the future holds and why he's trying to help her and their army end this war quickly. That originally the war would go on for a hundred years and so basically everyone who's fighting in the war currently will have died fruitlessly because well they will not live to see it actually end which while cool and all does make me 
wonder if Lewis is aware how stupid that sounds. Like, you of all people who watches all these movies and shit should know that messing with stuff from the past can have drastic consequences in the future. It's a classic time travel trope, and yet he seems pretty confident in just throwing caution to the wind with it. But anywho, by chapter's end, Jordan has more confidence in Lewis's abilities and knowledge. And then, out of nowhere, the Arbiter's attack. Chapter 5, Culture Shock. So, the evil Terrafell Arbiters are described as, quote, The Arbiters are different. Each one of them had every bit of their skin covered and hidden. They wore red leather gloves and long red robes. They somehow managed to move swiftly despite their size. To top it off was a large red helmet they wore. The helmets had two slit cuts for eye holes and had a tiny hole in the center for breathing, unquote. Which is actually a pretty cool design. However, Lewis's army fights the Arbiters and sees how they are easily overpowered by the red-clad men. And so Lewis decides to make a bold move. Quote, You Arbiters seem to enjoy picking on people smaller than you. Well, I'm smaller. Try picking on me, Lewis growled, and his blades quickly slid out of his gauntlets. Any of the Arbiters who were fighting the unit quickly shoved their adversaries aside and began advancing on Lewis. Lewis just grinned and beckoned them over to him. That's it, you crazy motherfuckers. Come closer, Lewis said, unquote. And then Lewis proceeds to go god mode on these suckas and fucks them up all really quite easily because he is, after all, quite powerful. And everyone sort of celebrates Lewis defeating all the Arbiters and they all have a drink of this um, drink called Geese which seems to fuck them all up really quickly after just one slug but doesn't really seem to affect Lewis all that much. Lewis then later talks to Jordan about time travel and how he views it as well as his own theory on it. Noting, quote, So, is time travel. You know, there's a theory on my world about time travel that I've already figured out, as opposed to the idiots who dwell on the question on countless occasions, Lewis said, sitting down to rest. Explain it to me, Jordan said, sitting next to Lewis. Well, the idea is, what if you went back in time and killed your own mother before you were born? If you had done that, you would never have been born. Therefore, you never went back in time and killed your mother, and so you were born and went back in time and killed your mother, etc, etc, Lewis explained. Is a paradox, Jordan stated. Precisely. The real answer is that it's entirely possible to do that because once you travel back in time and exist before you were born, you've moved outside of the normal confines of the space-time continuum, making you immune to any changes in the timeline, Lewis replied. Did you have a lot of odd conversations in your time period? Jordan asked, standing up again. Yeah, but they are mostly just philosophy, politics, religion, and what's the best topping for pizza? You know, come to think of it, I wonder what's going on with Vendo and the others back in the future, Lewis spoke, unquote. I guess that explains why he's doing what he's doing, if nothing else, and why he thinks changing stuff in the past will not affect the future. Though, it does beg the question why he would even bother doing any of this to begin with then. I guess just out of boredom? Maybe he just wants this timeline to have a better life than the one that his future one has? I'm not about to go into time travel mechanics and shit like that, but regardless, it's somewhat interesting. Meanwhile, back in the normal time, within like a few hours, Mira completely takes control back over the city of Soya and has all the Dark Knights, or at least a fair few of them that remained, come back to the city and fall under her new rule um, at the beck and call of her. This all happens off screen or off page rather, so yeah, that's all pretty quick. So Endo, Lithuminar, and White Raven all decide they need to go and save Javok from the prison in Soyland, and to then hopefully launch an attack on the city to get rid of the rest of the Dark Knights, with the help of the Army of Light and what have you. But in order to do that, they need to enter the city without being undetected, and so their plan for that is... 
Quote, Allow us to return to Soya. I can use an invisibility spell whenever we approach a group of dark knights and go through all the back alleys of the city so that we can avoid detection. No doubt they will be keeping Javok in the jail cells where Mir was being kept. We can retrieve him and get him back here, Endo suggested. Jermis stroked his chin, considering what Endo proposed. He looked over at Lithmanar and White Raven. You two would be willing to return to that area, he asked. White Raven nodded. Lithmanar shrugged. Well, I suppose I'm going to live forever anyway, so I might as well go on a suicide mission, Lithmanar replied. I'm pretty sure he meant to say, I'm not going to live forever, but, uh... Regardless, moving back on. Dermis once again considered his words and then smiled. Very well, he said, but I am coming with you, unquote. However, what is super bizarre is literally just a bit later in the chapter, after we have Lewis's whole speech about time travel mechanics, and we once again go back to Endo and crew, quote, Endo shifted uncomfortably around in the heavy armor she was wearing. The weight of the armor wasn't what was bothering her, but the fact that the armor had been that of the Dark knights. In order to successfully infiltrate Soya without a great deal of suspicion, the small group had to dress like dark knights in the hope of fooling the dark knights long enough for them to get General Javok and escape unharmed." Unquote. Which is extremely bizarre that they went with a completely different plan than the one they suggested. And what's more is this one is way worse because they didn't even take the time to hide Endo's cat ears and tail. And that ultimately is how they get found out and captured themselves. Of note, though, along the way is they do see that the Dark Knights are now allowed to have emotions since the darkness is dead, and they all find that rather interesting. But yeah, all the same, Endo and her lot get found out pretty quickly and then are just as quickly apprehended and thrown into the same cell as General Javok. Chapter 6, Allegiances 1. So like the first book, this one has several chapters with the title of Allegiances following a theme. The theme of the first book in that case was Endo getting, uh, well, sexually exploited. But in this one, it seems to be about White Raven and her feelings towards the Dark Knights. With all of them captured, Mira decides to take White Raven aside and offers her a deal. Quote, and now you have an army that's ready to swarm into the world and take it just like the darkness tried, White Raven said. Mira shook her head. We are not like the weak darkness, Raven. We shall not seek conquest. All we want is the city and to be left alone, until you gain enough troops and support that shall enable you to take over the five lands, White Raven yelled. Mira walked over to White Raven and pointed out the window. Look out into the streets, Raven. Do you see people roaring with a thirst for battle? Do you see Terrafell Arbiters trying to enforce their religion on others? Do you see the monarchs of the Dark Times imposing unjust and unfair laws on the civilians? No, you don't. Most of them have grown tired of war and constant battle. Many of them have expressed a desire to hang up their swords and attempt to raise a family with the few female knights that we have among us. I myself have already declared that I shall take on many mates if it means letting them have children. You cannot deny these people their rights, Raven. They want a home of their own, and this is the ideal place for it. And what do you want of me, murderer? What does the Queen of the Eclipse Legion want of me? White Raven asked. I want you, Mira replied. Join me, unquote. A somewhat interesting development. But meanwhile, Endo's dad gets thrown in the same cell as the rest of them because he wasn't informed of the takeover of Soy City, I guess, and ended up being captured when he re-entered the city almost immediately. And from here, we get some important lore to relay to Endo and the rest. Quote, there is something that has been kept hidden from the entire Linkaran religion. It is a secret that has been passed down from one head priest of the first church to the other, Garrick stated. What secret? Ender inquired. The prophecies of Linkara that were split apart and sent to the other churches are not the only prophecies of the Linkara, Garrick replied. Javok blinked staring at Garrick. You mean to tell me that there are more than the depicted battles with the darkness? Garrick nodded. There is much 
much more. The Linkaran man was haunted by visions day and night. When he was not sleeping or preaching, he was writing down everything he saw and tried to interpret it into words. The primary scroll, the first prophecies, were the ones that were publicly declared before his assassination by the Terrafell Arbiters. Because of his death, he could not tell the people of what he saw in store for the Linkara after his victory over the darkness. But how is that possible? Endo asked. Linkara was killed in the battle with the darkness. Garrick bit his lower lip. Well, actually, he wasn't. Endo's eyes went wide. What? Unquote. So basically, they all find out that Lewis is still very much alive, because there was more prophecies and stuff like that. And later on, we even get the specific details that yes, it was written in the prophecy that he was going to go back in time during the Hundred Year War, yada yada yada. A bit contrived, but you know, whatever. Oh, and also White Raven does decide to go ahead and join Mira's Dark Eclipse Legion because, uh, because she wants to... Yeah, there's not really any real reason given for why she's joining Mira. No inner thought process for her in making this decision either. She's certainly not doing it in exchange for the lives of her friends or something. No, she just joins the evil rapist Witch Queen's Alliance and that's pretty much it. I suppose it could be inferred that she's doing this to spy on the Queen and whatnot, but that's not elaborated upon and honestly, with how Endo acted near the very end of the first book in betraying Lewis for the darkness for extremely dumb reasons, it can also easily be assumed that White Raven joined Mira because uh, she's fucking stupid. So that's pretty cool, I guess. Meanwhile, back in Lewis's time frame, he and a band of his troops are undercover going into a city run by Terrafell Arbiters, and uh, they need to keep their cover. But Lewis sees a public execution going on and can't stand the injustice of these innocent people dying while he watches. So he breaks their cover and saves the people, killing all the Arbiters in the area while he's at it, much to the anger of Jordan as it was a risky move and it completely blew their cover. Not that it mattered to Lewis since, well, he is fucking invincible. This puts the two on non-speaking terms for a bit before they eventually start to talk again as they travel and eventually Lewis has a long conversation with her about individuality and what have you. So you have to understand that the thing that was taken away from the people in the book Brave New World is their ability to make choice. They've been conditioned and brainwashed since birth to only believe and think certain things and forced into a class system. They aren't given the choice to actually have children or have their children genetically engineered. As a matter of fact, love is considered taboo and illegal. It is indeed a disturbing idea, Captain. What does this conditioning entail? Jordan asked. It includes things that would normally be used on testing laboratory rats, babies at a young age. When they're taught to be in the working class, they are brought into a room. They are shown a book with shiny colors on it and some flowers. When they try to approach the objects, they are given electrical shocks to deter them from nature and reading. It's horrifying! And every one of them in any class system is forced to listen to brainwashing tapes basically telling them that they are happy with their place in the world and they need to be obedient little servants in their fucked up little world, Lewis replied. The idea of the individual's rights and honor is sacred among my people. The Keen Warriors Code specifically outlines that it is the honor of the individual that takes precedent over the goals of the society because a society can corrupt more easily than a single warrior who can believe honor. We act as a united people, however, to help each other obtain honor and glory, Jordan explained. It gets even worse, Lewis stated. At later ages, at like six or seven, most of the children who are grown into these factories are let roam free like cattle. They're naked and encouraged to have sex with one another. And why not? Most sexually transmitted disease aren't a threat anymore. Love isn't a consideration, and birth control takes care of pregnancy. I swear, it's sickening that these people in the book believe that a child is in any way emotionally and physically ready for the act of sex, or should engage in it. It's not a matter of religious beliefs, but of biology and psychology. <clears throat> not to be that guy, but um, wasn't uh... Wasn't there a 14-year-old girl who was having sex with various characters in the last book? Didn't she say she got started when she was like 12? 
But regardless, moving on. But if this is all fiction, then why do you feel so horrified by it? Jordan inquired. Because it's a warning. Anything like that can happen if we're not careful. That's the real backbone of dark futures. They're entirely possible, and that's what makes them like a horror tale, Lewis explained, unquote. Uh, so yeah, once again, some of the best parts of these books is when Lewis is just kind of going off talking about something completely random and in no real association with the actual story, just kind of being on a soapbox. Chapter 7, This Grey Spirit. So basically, in this chapter, the new Linkara prophecies are more properly explained and expanded upon, and it's revealed that the Linkara has been taken to the past, and Endo realizes that she can save him by using one of the three forbidden spells, specifically the Time Gate spell, which allows you to travel through time. But they are in need of a level 7 Magi to use the spell, slash find where it is to begin with, and so they need to get in contact with this fella named Cherido Neriti, who I shall now, in the future, simply refer to as Cheerio. So they escape the cell thanks to Lithuminar's pickpocket skills, but in the end, Endo and Garrick and Jeremis escape to tell the armies of what is going on in the city of Soya so the Army of Light can go and fight them, as well as find the level 7 Magi Cheerio, while Lithuminar and General Javok are left behind as a distraction. Meanwhile, Lewis is still progressing in his quest to defeat the Terrafil Arbiters, and Jordan is still questioning him if he's a good leader and shit, and it's kind of all going nowhere on their end at the moment. Chapter 8, On the Firing Line. So basically this chapter, there's a bunch of talk about how the magic time travel spell works, and sort of theories about how dangerous it can be. It's interesting, but nothing really noteworthy. Besides, it's time travel, of course it's dangerous. Then they meet up with Cheerio and find the place where they can cast the spell. Again, all this is done very quickly, so sorry if it sounds like I'm rushing through this a bit. However, in the place where they go to cast this time travel spell, a bunch of skeletons start coming alive, and they quickly realize that Mira had several of her Dark Knights go and follow them, and now they know exactly where they are. And so they're gonna have to cast a spell quickly, if any of them are gonna be able to go back in time to save Lewis. And in the end, fucking Cheerio and Jermis go back in the past, but Endo and her father are left there to be recaptured by Mira. Meanwhile, White Raven takes some time to look around and talk with various Dark Knights in the Soy Village. And she finds it interesting that all the Dark Knights now can showcase their emotions and stuff, and really showcase how they feel. She learns about their dreams and aspirations, and most of them really do just want to chill out and get married and have kids, and and keep to themselves, now that they're no longer under the influence of the darkness. Which White Raven seems to be okay with, and agrees this is a good step forward for all of them in the same way that she tried to improve her life when she got away from the darkness. However, she is ultimately suspicious if these goals truly align with that of their Dark Queen. Oh, and also, Lewis and Jordan are still arguing and stuff, so yeah, moving onward. Chapter 9, In Purgatory's Shadow. So this chapter is rather interesting because the whole arguing between Lewis and Jordan finally comes to a head when Jordan notes how Lewis fights the Arbiters with reckless abandon and how it puts everyone else in danger, and he doesn't fight with honor, and how it seems like he fights simply because he enjoys killing, which leads into one of the most wild rants in the book series. No, you have to stop, Jordan yelled, interrupting him. I don't have to do anything. I am doing this to save lives, Lewis shouted back at her. You act not as a man trying to save lives, but as a man on a vendetta for blood. You are acting more like a Terrafell Arbiter than a man, Jordan growled. Lewis narrowed his eyes and stormed up to Jordan's face. Don't you ever compare me to those monsters. How dare you even begin to contemplate that I am anything like them. You slay them simply because they are arbiters. You do not take into account any facts or details before you. You kill simply out of hatred. That is not honorable. Well, you'll forgive me, Leftant, if I don't think of your fucking honor. Of all things is a logical reason for the war with the Arbiters. Then what is, oh Linkara? What possible justification is there for any action to be taken against the Arbiters as you have? Oh, here we go, Lewis growled, rolling his eyes. What are you talking about? Jordan demanded to know. You know, you're a real piece of work, you know that? 
You and every other goddamn tree-hugging commie hippie fucker! Oh no, we can't go to war in Iraq. It's none of our business. This isn't a war on terror, it's a war on Islam. Hitler isn't a fascist dictator hoping for world domination. He's a fairly stable leader with a Charlie Chaplin mustache. We only want Kuwait's oil. We're desecrating holy land. On and on, you people constantly open your mouths. But it's only an excuse to avoid the fact that people are dying and no one is doing anything to save them. And what does this have to do with the Arbiter's lives? You're embracing their principles of death. You reject the Linkaran religion, which is one of truth, faith, and peace. Even I, a member of the New Blood Order, know that. This war we're fighting isn't about principles, religion, or conquest, Jordan. It's about life! I am not doing the things I do because I like to kill Jordan, but because I want to save life! God forbid we actually care about a human life on this planet. No one can ever see the fucking picture. Do none of you people ever look out the goddamn window? In Saudi Arabia, 17 schoolgirls burned to death because of religious police wouldn't let the girls escape from a burning building because they weren't wearing the proper dress. In Iraq, Saddam Hussein tested chemical and biological weapons on a village just to test their effectiveness and staged a massacre on Iraqi Kurds. In the name of ethnic cleansing, Iraq, Pakistan, North Korea, half the world has gone to hell in a handbasket, but we refuse to do anything about it because we're so caught up in the idea of hating anything our leaders have to say because we supposedly can't trust them anymore. 11 million people died because of the Nazis. 3,000 people died in the World Trade Center attacks of 9-11, and hundreds of people die every day on the streets of Israel because of suicide bombings. Look around you, Jordan! And what am I supposed to see? Jordan growled. You're supposed to see the horrible things that happen all around you, and do something about them. How about extremist groups, not only bent on religious terrorism, but domestic terrorists like neo-Nazis and the Ku Klux Klan? How about the people who raise their kids to hate other people, eh? How about the sickos out there who convince innocent children that it's right to hate someone else because of their skin color? or who they want to fall in love with. The Arbiters are no goddamn different than any other organizations from my world. All that's different is the names. Al-Qaeda or Arbiters, Hitler or the Darkness. I refuse to let it happen anymore, Jordan. Do you hear me? I won't let it happen anymore! I don't even know what you're talking about, Jordan stated, backing off. That's right, you don't, Lewis said. And then Lewis winced, looking away from Jordan, and closed his eyes. I, I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. Lewis winced once more, then sat down on a rock, putting his head in his hands. The tear escaped his eye. He began to slowly rock back and forth, breathing carefully as he held his face in his hands. There's so much evil in all my world, Jordan. I'm not sure if there's more on yours or mine. I can barely keep myself steady. All I can do when I see an Arbiter is see the millions if not billions of people who died because of evil. I hear the voices of the people who have been wronged, whose lives and ways of life have been ripped from them because of the acts of madmen. All their voices seem to scream out at me for vengeance. I see them when I close my eyes. Even when I blink, they're there. Do you realize just how hard it is to be an optimist in this world? Every day I know exactly what goes on in the world, and all the evil that exists there. But I have to constantly hold out hope that everything's going to be alright, and that I or someone like me can make a difference out there in the world, run by madmen. I, I tried so hard, Jordan. I'm just so very tired. He said, and he closed his eyes and cried silently. Jordan's face turned to one of regret and sadness. She walked over to Lewis and put her hand on his shoulder, trying to comfort him. She slowly sat down beside him on the rock. Lewis's weeping slowed as he began to calm himself. Jordan turned her face to him and met his gaze. Unquote. So, uh... Yeah, if you had 9-11 coming up in this book series on your bingo card, uh, congratulations. Once again, though, these are without a doubt my favorite parts of these books when Lewis, and by Lewis I mean both the character and the author, 
just fucking go off about something with religion, politics, philosophical, or really anything like that, and just kind of steps up on his soapbox and goes at it. It says a lot about the author at the time, how he viewed the world and his own personal politics and what have you, and how he definitely had a hatred for Islam, as well as Hitler, the Ku Klux Klan, and I guess really anyone that is causing damage against people. This is the writing of a teenager who is angry and frustrated and just wants to throw up all over the page. It almost reads like a strange sort of manifesto. And if you were to change the names of the Arbiters to something more realistic, it would probably be pretty scary to be honest. But once again, I can't get enough of this sort of stuff. I love this shit. It's extremely interesting to me. So go get him, King. You go off. Please let the next extremely off-topic and wild rant come sooner rather than later. Because I won't lie, this second book up until this point was really starting to, um fucking bore me because I sort of felt that the story was kind of going nowhere for a bit. I mean the plot's progressing, like don't get me wrong, but it just sort of feels like things are just in an awkward limbo. People keep being captured and then escape and then are captured again and then Lewis and Jordan are fighting and then Lewis wins the argument and then they fight again and yada yada yada. It's been that for like 60 pages of just pure tedium up to this point. But this rant right here really woke my ass up. And this talk ultimately does end up with Lewis realizing that maybe he's not fit to lead as the captain of this group. And so in an act of character development, he actually decides to appoint Jordan as the captain of the Keen Soldiers, and Jordan decides to make him their new lieutenant. her now clearly gaining a lot of respect and understanding of Lewis as a person from this. Everyone celebrates, yada yada yada, you get it. Meanwhile, Endo and the others, again besides Cheerio, the 7th level Magi, and Jarvis, the, uh, other guy, are captured again in Mira's dungeon, with nothing really interesting going on there at the moment. And also White Raven is seeing some very suspect behavior from Mira as to be expected. Chapter 10, Questionable Intent. So something I haven't really brought up until now is, uh, well, a rather important plot detail regarding Lewis's side of things. See, because he's fighting in the old war from the past, he plans on having it finish quicker, right? We did at least establish that. Well, in order to do that, there's this dude named Algarian, Prince Algarian, who has secrets regarding the dragons that the Terrafell Arbors control, and he knows something about them that will render them useless to them and will allow Keen and anyone else who fights the Terrafell Arbiters to win the war quickly. But historically, Algarian died and the information that he had died with him and was never learned until many, many years later. Thus why the war went on for so long. So Lewis wants to change history by saving Prince Algarian and getting that info early. And in the pursuit of this goal, they enter the city in which he is being held and where he is going to be executed. When they suddenly hear that just as they arrive, Prince Algarian is about to be executed. So Lewis makes it just in the nick of time to stop the execution and has Jordan and the rest go safeguard Algarian, while Lewis then hands himself over to Terrafell Arbiters as a distraction. We then get this long set of scenes where Lewis is being interrogated by the Arbiters. Quote, the door to the dungeon swung open, revealing that there were two red-robed guards protecting the room from interruption. A single person entered the room, the robes not red or black, but that of light sky blue. He was holding several pieces of paper and a feather pen with an ink well. Lewis continues smiling at the man as he sat down opposite of him at the table. Do you know who I am? The man asked in a light voice. Well, judging by your robes, I'd say you were a member of the Pussy Arbiters. Lewis said, stilling, smiling. The man stared at him. I beg your pardon? Well, at least I'd assume it was the Pussy Arbiters. I mean, 
You've got the red-robed arbiters with their superior strength, and the my penis is so small I have to compensate with this thing axes. And you've got the black-robed arbiters who just emit an air of evil about them when you're in their presence. But then we've got you, the blue-robed pansy arbiter who's just a lame-ass interrogator because he long ago realized he was a pussy and couldn't handle a military or administrative life. Lewis explained. The interrogator stared at Lewis, who leaned back in his chair and continued grinning. Lewis tilted his head. So what's up, dickface? Your attitude is not unexpected, considering we've heard about those from Keen. Allow me to explain what your duty is now. You are prisoner of the Terrafell Arbiters, he began. Lewis leaned forward. Oh, I'm on the edge of my seat. Now that you're a prisoner of the Terrafell Arbiters, it is now a requirement that you pray to he who watches over us. Hans Terrafell. Terrafell is a pussy, Lewis interrupted. The interrogator continued. You will pray to him twice a day in the manner we order you to. You will be fed once a day, provided you cooperate. Cooperation will be rewarded. Resistance will be punished. Cooperation and your food rations will be increased, and your standards of living shall increase. Resistance and the information will be tortured out of you slowly, and you will receive only food and life giver to keep you alive. Lewis giggled a little in his seat. I may not show it, but I do not care for your well-being. Your arrogance in this situation is beginning to annoy me, and with a snap of my fingers, I can happily have one of those guards come in here and break your legs. Maybe you had some kind of control and power back in the deserts of Keen, with people throwing themselves on their own swords in an attempt to please you. But now you are in AI, and you are in chains. I am in control and you will obey. Lewis smiled and held up his arms that were chained together. With one quick movement, he separated his arms, and conveniently, the chains attaching them. The Arbiter tried to call out for help, but Lewis moved quicker, his right hand shooting out and grasping Grasping the interrogator's neck, he squeezed lightly, not wanting to shock him just yet. The interrogator stared at Lewis's eyes as he grinned. You are in control? I have snapped your chains like a toothpick, and I can snap your neck just as easily. If you send someone in to break me, I will break them. If you try to torture me, I will unleash nightmares the likes of which you have never seen. I am the Linkara. And because of that, I have every reason to be arrogant. So take your fucking questions to someone else and stop wasting my time, you Weasley son of a bitch! Lewis pushed forward, releasing the interrogator and letting him fall back into his chair. He quickly gathered his papers and knocked on the door, indicating that he wanted to leave. As soon as the door opened slightly, he rushed out and left Lewis alone again. Lewis leaned back in his chair and closed his eyes. Raindrops keep falling on my head, he sang, unquote. So yeah, as to be expected, Lewis is in no real danger, and the scene plays out like that for a while. But eventually, the chief of the loyalty officers of the Arbiters, Hansass Rowak, trying to interrogate him himself but again also falling flat, the Linkara putting them all in their place. Then eventually Lewis is broken out of the jail by Jordan and the other keen soldiers. And dear god, this book feels like it's on repeat constantly. How many times have people been thrown in prison just to be as quickly broken out in this book at this point? Uh, anyway, they then try to escape, but uh-oh, just as they are trying to escape the city, two dragon riders show up. Shit's about to get real. Chapter 11, Allegiances 2. Okay, so this chapter takes place entirely in the present time, and it's about what else but Indo and the gang escaping prison again. Meanwhile, it is sort of revealed that White Raven has been pretending to be on Mira's side this whole time to spy on her, I suppose, or maybe it was just to buy time. Never really elaborated upon what her plan was, but yeah. But she's sent to stop them and essentially, um, convincingly lets them defeat her so that uh, they can escape. Mira, meanwhile, is panicking because the city is getting ready to be attacked by the Army of Light, and there is a ceremony that she wants to have conducted that she hasn't been able to do yet. One that would be able to, like, summon a evil dark demon thing? It's not really important, but regardless, she ends up having all her Dark Knights cast a spell 
of Lok Mengwo on her, which was the spell that Endo had casted on Lewis at the end of the first book that helped him get super powered enough to defeat the darkness. So now she is going to be super powered to be able to defeat the army of light. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Chapter 12, The Cassandra Conflict. Time for the novel's namesake chapter. In this chapter, basically Lewis kills the two dragon riders and through the battle, he ends up actually riding a top one of the dragons and through this he finds out that the dragons can actually talk telepathically which is kind of cool however they are ultimately loyal to the Terrafell Arbiters and whenever the uh Terrafell Arbiter is killed the dragon just decides to go fuck off however in the scuffle Prince Algarian who again was supposed to have the information to make the war end 80 years sooner is then suddenly killed in the heat of battle meaning history cannot be changed changed so drastically, which also means Jordan in that time while Lewis was in prison didn't ask Algarian what the info was. So I guess Lewis being captured to distract them was for literally no fucking reason, especially because he could have just broken out of the prison himself. Um, so what were they doing that whole time? What, what a colossal waste of time. Would have made more sense to just have them die before they save them or some shit. But anyway, this leads to Lewis describing the Cassandra conflict in his anguish and anger over the whole situation. Quote, It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Lewis spoke. All eyes turned to him. Jordan in particular seemed to glare at him. And what is that supposed to mean, Leftant? Jordan asked. Algarian is dead. The knowledge he had is lost forever. The Cassandra conflict, Lewis said. They all stated blank confused by his words. The what? One of them finally asked. Cassandra was a Greek goddess, someone from my world's mythology. She had the ability to foretell the future accurately and with no discrepancy. However, she was then cursed with the fact that although she could see the future and predict it, she had no way of changing it. And that's where... We are right now, folks. I'm Cassandra, who can tell you all about the future, but either no one will believe me, like in the case of your retarded king, or the fact that I can't change the future, like in the fact that Prince Algarian, who knew a way for this war to end 80 years early than it's supposed to, sparing thousands if not millions of lives, is now lying dead in some field. What's the point of us even doing anything now? We failed in our mission, and now this damned war war will continue, Lewis said, his voice never deviating or changing to reflect his different moods of anger and sadness." Unquote. However, Jordan and the other soldiers of Keen are unfazed by this and seems to have joyous optimism, for once more so than Lewis. And by chapter's end, the mage Cheerio is finally here and is able to talk to Lewis about bringing him back to his time frame. Meanwhile, Mira uses the Lok Wo spell and she basically goes Super Saiyan from this and is able to handily defeat um the Army of Light and save her city from the invasion. White Raven seems rather conflicted about this whole thing as it goes on. And while it's kind of a cool scene, I suppose, very anime-like, um, it's not really worth going into detail about. But it's definitely not bad. So, moving on. Chapter 13. Roosevelt was right. This chapter is all about the plot threads sort of mixing together now, and Lewis, Cheerio, and Jeremis touch base with why Lewis was brought back in time, and how they are going to bring him back using the Time Gate spell. And they also bring up the influx of Dark Knights and Mira taking over them, blah, 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 blah. You kind of get it. It's just sort of reestablishing everything we the readers already know to Lewis. However, the thing is, in their escape from the city, they ended up going into this dark temple of sorts that the Arbiters refused to go into because um, it's haunted with an evil spirit or some shit like that. But this allows them time to figure out how to escape, since they are now very much cornered, and as soon as they leave, they are going to be captured and most likely killed. So Lewis and Cheerio come up with a plan to make a mechanical firearm flamethrower of sorts to scare the Arbiters into thinking that they have harnessed the power of the dragons themselves, but in a portable package. And so they build just that, and then Lewis walks out from the demon castle and uses the flamethrower on a tree, scaring all of the Arbiters and allowing the Keen soldiers to be able to escape. And yeah, that's pretty much the chapter. 
definitely not a bad one. Kind of interesting in that um, they gotta come up with a solution out of a situation, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Chapter 14, Full Circle. We then touch base with Mira having won the battle, and she's basically got an extra morale boost at this point, and White Raven is again being wishy-washy. Same shit, whatever. Meanwhile, Lewis has a moment of what I'm gonna call extreme depression. He's sad and angry. He wants to go home. He misses his family. But also, he's missing Endo, and he's tired of being this god figure for people when he's just 14 years old. Quote, Are you alright? He asked. Lewis bit his lower lip, closing his eyes and sniffling a little. No, Cheerio. I'm not alright. Lewis responded. What's the matter? Can I help? He asked getting down on one knee. Lewis gritted his teeth. No, you can't, Cheerio. This has been building for a while now. It's just, I've been able to keep it down until an hour ago. What has, my lord? Cheerio asked. Everything, he said, tightening his grip around his legs. Cheerio, I've been on this planet for about six months and I can't take much more of this. This forest, these clothes, the constant battle, I'm sick of it. But I've never seen you express any kind of sadness before. It's all an act, Cheerio! I put on a brave face and I suck up my sadness and tell myself I need to focus on the tasks at hand instead of dwelling on things I can't control. The food is the same over and over. My hair is a disheveled mess without any shampoo or regular showers, and I have to kill people to stay alive. That is not the life for a 14 year old. Hell, I've probably missed my 15th birthday back on Earth by now. I can barely remember what my parents look like, or my freaking brother who always used to call me a dork. My friends are all back on Earth, and I know if they even know I'm gone, or if no time has passed, or if I'm even going to get home. I don't have any teachers to have discussions or debates with, no internet to communicate with people around the world, and keep up the illusion that I actually exist in the outside world, and no people to tell me that they love me and they appreciate me. I appreciate and love you, my lord, Furio said. Oh, shut the fuck up! Lewis yelled, standing up. You're only doing so because I represent your goddamn religion. Guess what, Magi? I don't want to be your religious leader. I want to sit around and watch TV or read comics and manga. You people thrust your praises and your beliefs onto me and expect me to act out the role that I have no interest in acting out. This armor was an accident, nothing more. Stop calling me my lord. I'm not your lord. I'm just a kid who was thrown into a situation beyond his control. Furio continued sitting, gaping at Lewis, with his mouth wide open. Lewis continued, As a matter of fact, there's only one other person who might have actually truly loved me, and that's Endo. But she's not here, and by the way you described the way you left her in Van, I'm never going to see her again. I hate you! I hate this whole fucking planet! Lewis fell to his knees, pounding his fists on the grass and soil. I want to go home! I don't want this! place anymore. The welled up tears in his eyes flowed down his cheeks as he continued slamming his fist into the ground. I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. Unquote. And I'll admit, it's actually a nice moment of vulnerability for Lewis after all this bravado and shit. And what's more is this chapter actually ends with the camp that they set up in the forest being attacked including a dragon and dragon rider being ridden by Rohak, no less, the uh, chief guy that um, he kind of made a mockery of before back in the prison. And for once, Lewis actually, in his attempt to stop them, messes up this time. Quote, Rohak laughed in demonic glee as he brought the dragon around to face Lewis and kicked the dragon on one of his lung sacks. Through training, the dragon had quickly learned that this meant he should shoot its fire, and it complied. Lewis winced and tried to bring his wings around to shield him from the blast, but it was too late. A fireball propelled from the dragon's mouth, slapping directly into Lewis's chest. The explosion engulfed him instantly, and he shut his eyes to protect them from any of the fire. As if the armor consciously knew of the danger to Lewis, part of it quickly spread upward and covered his face. He screamed for a moment, but finally lacked the strength to continue as he felt all of his limbs go limp and numb. The fire itself 
soon subsided, leaving only smoke, which Lewis quickly fell from. The armor that had protected his face had not protected his hair, so most of the long hair that had grown for months of not attending to a barber burned off quickly, leaving most of his head a bald mess. The armor on his face retracted into the main body and fell to the ground, his consciousness escaping him. The last thing Lewis remembered then was the screams coming from Jordan and Cheerio." Unquote. Leaving the chapter on a cliffhanger. Not bad. Not a bad chapter. Chapter 15. Behind Enemy Lines 1. So this chapter is, um, interesting because Lewis has what I would call an Evangelion moment, where he appears in a dark void all to himself, with another version of himself talking to himself. It's a very existential scene that serves the purpose of sort of getting inside of Lewis's head. However, while he's having this scene happen, he also goes out of his way to make fun of Shinji Akari from Evangelion. Quote, Who am I? Perhaps I am your armor, a sentient being who shares a symbiotic relationship that you're not aware of. Perhaps I'm your conscience, come to make you see all of the horrible mistakes you've made. Or perhaps, the being replied. The other Lewis kneeled down, getting closer to Lewis's sad eyes. Perhaps I'm the real you. I'm the Lewis Williamson who, at the beginning of his high school year, decided that he was going to stop being a pansy ass and take control of his life. Perhaps I'm the Lewis who watched Evangelion and said to himself, I'm not going to end up like that whiny little bitch Shinji Akari. What the hell happened to you, kid? Get off the ground and stand up for what you want. Lewis winced and grit his teeth, once again trying to get up, but he fell to the ground once more. The other Lewis rolled his eyes. Well, I suppose that's all you can do. All you can do is lie on the ground and prove to everyone just how much they can walk all over you. Lewis mumbled something. The other Lewis raised an eyebrow, curious. What did you say? The other Lewis asked. Nothing, Lewis murmured. It sure didn't sound like nothing. What did you say? Nothing. What did you say? Lewis bit his lower lip and mumbled again. What did you say? Lewis opened his eyes in the real world and exclaimed, I said shut the fuck up, you blood-belching vagina. Unquote. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's pretty interesting. It's like he loved the ideas of Evangelion and wanted to emulate a scene from it for his novel, but he didn't want to seem as vulnerable and had to point out that he's nothing like Shinji, or at least he's definitely nothing like Shinji now, or whatever. But, uh, whatever really. It's not that important. It just kind of took me out of the moment a little bit. I would have preferred he just had this scene play out by itself without another random reference, I guess. But regardless, he ends up waking up after this and does end up defeating the Arbiters in the end, and saves everyone. Meanwhile, Mira is seemingly drunk with power and angry that this other Dark Knight named General Varric the Destroyer, who just recently arrived in the city, seems to still have faith in the original darkness and not in her. And since this character will become important, uh, not in this book, but in a later book, I will go ahead and read his description. Quote, his hair was a dark blue, contrasting with his pale skin and red eyes. He wore a thick black armor with a dark cape equipped to the shoulders, almost as if he were attempting to boast superiority over others." Unquote. Chapter 16, Behind Enemy Lines 2. Okay, so there's like a lot of juggling in this chapter, but to start, Endo asks Lithmanar, God, remember Lithmanar? Uh, anyway, she asks him what his deal is with being a thief, why he's a thief, and he answers with, quote, It's a matter of freedom. From what? The monarchy. The ones who impose laws on us to keep us in check so that we don't rebel and take over ourselves, unquote. So yeah. Just figured I'd note that since Lufinar really hasn't had almost any dialogue in this book, and I found it somewhat interesting. Meanwhile, Lewis and Co. continue to fight more Arbiters again, but now the Arbiters have fucking lightning guns because of weird time continuum fuckery shit or something like that. Basically, there's like a bunch of stuff from the present time being transferred over to the past. There's even a scene where Lewis and Co. 
are out in the forest and they see Rain Vendra's house. You remember her, right? She died at the very beginning of the first book, or near the beginning anyway. Well, they come across that at some point and take refuge there for a while. And now there are lightning guns because of a similar thing, I guess. It's mostly just a means of power scaling them up since Lewis has defeated several of the dragons multiple times at this point. This is kind of like ups the ante. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Endo's father, Garrick, is randomly visited by a ghost of a woman who is described as, quote, a 20-year-old woman suddenly materialized in front of him. She was sitting on her knees, with red armor covering most of her body. She had long blonde hair, with a red helmet sitting atop her head, with small horns protruding from it. She didn't appear to be very tall, but her features were fair and beautiful, and Garrick was charmed by her beauty for a moment before he spoke with her again. How did you do that? He asked. I'm not entirely sure. It's a matter of focus, he responded, her voice voice having a natural echo to it. Garrick tilted his head to the side in confusion. Who, what are you? My name is Thesia, priest. I'm a ghost, a spirit. The woman now identified as Thesia replied, unquote. But yeah, this ultimately goes nowhere, but Thesia will be somewhat important in a like later part, mostly in a later book. But yeah, then the chapter ends with Lithwinar and Endo hearing a growl in the sewers that they've been exploring under Soya since escaping the prison, as well as escaping Mira's like Super Saiyan Rampage earlier. Chapter 17, The Carbomite Maneuver. All right, skipping ahead a little bit because we're kind of wasting time at this point, but the basics are more fighting with the Arbiters happen, Lewis and co get cornered yet again, but this time Lewis convinces the Arbiters to leave him and his lot alone completely on a bluff that the secret behind his golden armor is revealed and that the others will soon have the same armor as him and then they will have to contend with a whole army of warriors just like him bearing in mind that their lightning guns works on everyone else except for Lewis and now they would work on none of them and so they ultimately fuck off Meanwhile, Mira is getting ready to do this grand ceremony called the Genesis Ceremony, which requires a sacrifice in order to summon this demon, and so she orders White Raven to go and get a sacrifice for her. Mind you that she has convinced people that the demon will be good for protection, but it seems as though she wants to use it for conquest, actually. Chapter 18, Allegiances 3. So now that White Raven fully is aware of Mira's plan, she decides to reveal herself fully to be a good guy. She then saves Garrick from his prison and communicates with Endo telepathically to let her know that she's on her side, as well as what's going on and that she only wants Mira dead, and that she pleads with Endo to try to make peace with the other Dark Knights, that they are good, and that it is only Mira that is worth killing, and Endo ultimately agrees with her. Uh, then Endo and Lithmanar escape a giant fucking shit-eating monster in the sewer, and head back up to the surface of Soy City, and then White Raven gets the chance to kill Mira again. Her arrow clearly pointed at her. But then, like, she is fucking convinced to not just kill Mira right then and there because, uh, because, uh, quote, White Raven repositioned her arrow up at a nearby building's roof. Upon the roof stood Mira and two dark sorcerers. The dark sorcerer's spells had missed White Raven, and now she seemed ready to kill any one of them who made the slightest move. Tell me, Raven, do you think I'm a complete imbecile? I knew you would never abandon your friends, Mira shouted, calling down to White Raven. An imbecile? No, I think you're completely insane, but not an imbecile, White Raven called back. And I'm insane for wanting a future for our people? You want to have me be like the darkness? Mir replied. No, you're insane because you kidnapped, tortured, and raped a Linkaran priestess. You're insane because you asserted yourself as the ruler of the Dark Knights, and you think that only you can lead them into glory. You're insane because you take pleasure in the suffering of others, and drink Autus over the dead bodies of the innocent. You do not seek peace, you witch. You seek power and conquest. Like the darkness? No, you are the darkness. 
White Raven growled. So, what will you do now, Raven? Kill me? Perhaps you haven't noticed, but these people here have come to know me for who I really am. The vision of what you perceive me to be is a fantasy, a fiction. If you kill me, I will be a martyr and live on in the hearts of these people who know me for who I really am, and not the evil blob that you associated me with. What makes it worse is that if you kill me, there will be a power struggle for the throne. You were my second-in-command, Raven. We still haven't organized a local government yet, which means that dozens of people will be claiming the throne as their own. And who will win in the end? The most ruthless, the most cunning, the most devious general of my army, Varric the Destroyer. And despite whatever opinions you hold of me, you know that if Varric were the king of the Eclipse Legion, then the Legion will be a force for evil. And you can't let that happen, Raven. White Raven lingered for a moment, her eyebrow twitching slightly as she kept her arrow aimed at Mira. Her best instincts told her to release the arrow, to let the weapon soar through the air and spill her blood and brains out onto the shingles of the building. She wanted to have that smile on her face turn into fear and shock. To just let this being that radiated evil from the very air she breathed fall to the ground in a crumbled mass of flesh and armor. However, she couldn't do it, because despite Mira's evil, despite her deceptive, demonic nature, she was absolutely right. Her allegiance may not be to Mira, but it was still to her people, the Dark Knights. And so White Raven lowered her weapon, allowing for the other Dark Knights to come to her and hold her at bay, unquote. So, he's like, uh, is White Raven fucking stupid? Is she fucking dumb? Like, how the fuck did that speech work? Huh, well, I know I'm fucking evil and everything, but if you kill me, then another evil person will, like, come into power, okay? And so they'll just kill that other evil person. What's the fucking big deal? Also, I personally would have felt that this would have been a stronger character moment for White Raven if she did actually shoot the arrow of Mira. Even if she ultimately wasn't able to kill her, that she wanted what was best for her people, and that she would, even if she had to be the villain in this scenario, um, take out the person that is is clearly leading them astray. I feel like that would have been a stronger character moment than what she just did right there. But, um, you know, whatevs, I guess. Meanwhile, Lewis is then suddenly attacked by, like, a dark shadow of sorts while the time gate spell was getting ready to be used. And so now he's pulled into yet another mental battle with this dark, inky darkness that comes out of nowhere. Chapter 19, Nightmares in Light. So like I said, they were about to cast the time gate spell, but then Lewis gets pulled into a mental battle with a shadow, kind of out of nowhere to be honest. But narratively, it serves as a moment, once again, of self-reflection for him, in which the shadow reveals to him some of his greatest fears and shit. The shadow seems to overpower Lewis. It won't allow him to use his armor here. It strips him naked, in fact, and forces him to feel like a pathetic boy with nothing to live for, and feeds into all of his self-doubt, desperation to be seen as a hero, and what have you. It's definitely not bad, and of course, there are several references to other movies and stuff like that, much like when Lewis fought a mental battle with the darkness in the first book. However, after ultimately being beaten into the ground over and over again, Lewis does ultimately win over the shadow by realizing that he has control over his own mind and dreams and uses his free will to conquer said shadow. I would say the whole thing is rather Jungian, but uh, I don't really want to give a 14 year old that much credit. But it was at least accidentally very Jungian. And then Lewis wakes back up and fucking Cheerio and Jordan all go through the time portal back to the present, which yes, Jordan ends up joining them sort of out of a necessity because the shadow was killing people and it was gonna end up killing her if she didn't go with them and so yada yada yada. Jordan is now in present time with the rest of them as well. Leading into the final chapter. Chapter 20, Foundations. Uh, so basically Mira is about to kill White Raven and Javok for the big sacrifice of sorts, since they basically fucking handed themselves over to her. And they are about to die with no real plan of escape, other than maybe hoping Endo and Lithmanar might get there in time. 
but are thankfully saved by Lewis when he jumps through the time portal thing, literally onto the stage where Mira is having the sacrifice take place, and then proceeds to punch the bitch once, count him one time, and she goes flying in a rather anticlimactic fashion. No, like seriously, after all this buildup, Lewis comes back for one second and fucking knocks that bitch out. Quote, Lewis blinked once and shifted his eyes from left to right, seeing Garrick and White Raven tied to the separate wooden poles. Uh, sorry, it was actually White Raven and Garrick, not White Raven and Javok in this book. And the assemblage of dark knights beneath him. Then he looked forward and saw Mira. Her eyes got wide as she he saw her, and although he thought he recognized her, he needed to be sure. He walked towards her, getting right in her face. She was still in complete shock from what she had just seen, her mouth hanging open as her heartbeat increased rapidly. Lewis narrowed his eyes. I know you, Lewis stated. Mira stopped breathing. You're that bitch who tortured and raped Endo, Lewis said calmly. Mira felt the blood draining down her spine from her face. The only thing she could do in the her frightened state was to nod at Lewis. Lewis in turn mentally commanded electricity to charge in his gauntlet, then delivered an uppercut with the gauntlet directly into Mira's chin. The impact from the energy sent Mira flying off the podium, going past the entire assemblage of Dark Knights and deep into the nearby swamp of Zlad Delta. The Dark Knights gasped as they followed Mira's brief flight and then quickly looked back at the Linkara. Lewis leapt into the air, his metallic golden wings suddenly shooting out of his back and his armor gliding him off the stage and in front of the Dark Knights, who backed up when he landed. He turned his head from left to right slowly, looking at the shocked Dark Knights." Unquote. So with that, the evil is beaten. Although he didn't end up killing Mira here, he just knocked her out way into the woods. I don't know why he didn't just stab her right here and there. People really have a problem with just killing Mira outright, but regardless. The Linkara then decides that the Dark Knights can live in peace in Soyland, even though he had no reason to do that at this point since he hadn't really seen them do anything um, other than evil before now. Would have made more sense if he was about to kill them all and then White Raven decides to inform him to, you know, not do that. I guess you could say this is character development because Lewis doesn't want to just kill things for the sake of killing them anymore, but it also would have made more sense if White Raven thought he was going to, and then so she like tells him all about what the Dark Knights have been doing, and then he says, oh, I wasn't going to kill them anyway, um, whatever, and then you could have his character development moment as well as White Raven actually informing him that they are not a danger, blah blah blah. It also would have showcased to the Dark Knights that White Raven is looking out for the best for them, that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, story over, I suppose. Except for the epilogue. Epilogue. The story ends with everyone being very happy. Lewis has plans to make it back to his own world, and him and Endo embrace in a passionate kiss. That sort of thing. The status quo being re-established, ready for the next adventure in the third book. Meanwhile, back in the other part of time, Rohak, again the chief guy of the Arbiters that Lewis ended up beating, and this other woman named Thesia, again the woman that appeared as a ghost to Garrick earlier, are having a conversation. And through this conversation, Thesia reveals that she seems to be the one that used that shadow before on Lewis right near the very end of this book, before he ended up going back to his normal time. And she, I guess, is the new big bad secretly plotting and planning something big. Something in the background for now to defeat the Linkara once and for all. All of which will be plot points that will show up probably in the next book, right? Well, no. The end. So overall my thoughts of Angel Armor, the Cassandra Conflict, is honestly, it's a little better in some ways in the first book, but also a fair bit worse in the first book in many ways too. Like sure, I guess we don't have needless cat girl rape and other weird stuff like that, but also this book is really fucking boring most of the time. It feels like a big waste of time mostly for just trying to get things back to the status quo for the third book. He's extremely repetitive with characters constantly being imprisoned and then escape or being cornered and then escaping that sort of thing. 
thing. The characters not killing other characters outright because the plot needs them to be alive, even though it makes sense for certain characters to kill other characters in those moments. While other characters that need to die, like Prince Algarian, die even though they had every opportunity to avoid that happening. They have all this talk about how the past can be changed and it won't affect the present and stuff, but they never actually go through with that and see what would happen. The villains, while kind of interesting, are mostly incompetent. Though, to be fair, that was a bit of an issue with the first book, too. And White Raven, as a character, seems to be given a lot more focus in this book, with Endo and Lithmanar taking extremely big back seats this time. But for all the extra screen time White Raven as a character gives, she doesn't really have much of an arc. She just decides she's going to look out for the Dark Knights and proceeds to make a lot of wishy-washy and dumb decisions along the way. She isn't even ultimately the one to save the Dark Knights, it's just Lewis again. I feel like the dynamic between her and Mira could have been amped up some. Honestly, as weird as it would have been, I kind of was expecting Mira to try to like seduce White Raven or something like that. Something strange of that sort but that never really happens. On the flip side, Lewis's character arc was a little bit better this time, though it too did come off as a little skizo at times with how quickly he jumped from one emotion to the other, especially some of the crazy rants he had that had really nothing to do with anything going on. But again, honestly, that was some of the most interesting and entertaining parts of this novel. Also, Jordan as a character is alright, I suppose. Though it is probably worth noting that, for as much as Jordan calls Lewis out, I feel like there are several times when he's going particularly crazy or wild that she definitely could have called him out on his shit more. Because honestly, Lewis throughout this entire novel is kind of insufferable. I mean, it's really funny from a reading perspective, and if the story leaned into that dynamic more, it kind of had it be more of a comedy, I could actually really get behind it. But because it's so self-serious and everything, Lewis kind of just comes off as a know-it-all asshole. Which he kind of had that a little bit in the first book as well, but it's really ramped up here. Which paired with his crazy rants about dictators and terrorism and religion and stuff like that, which again feels a lot like word vomit from an angsty teenager that just has a lot of feelings and emotions about a lot of things but doesn't actually know like anything of what they're actually talking about. It feels with as much as Jordan was calling him out rightfully so on his bad behavior, as soon as he broke down and started going especially crazy and crying, she just kind of buckled and seemed to completely understand him. And while I can understand that on some level, I also think realistically her character probably would have been more like, why are you crying? I don't know what any of this shit you're talking about is. And her suspicions about him being a child that doesn't know anything about anything and is just sort of thrust into the seat of power is pretty justifiably showcased here. Still, all the same, even with all that being said, this entire part of the story is still my favorite aspect of this particular novel because I think it perfectly encompasses that exact essence of a teenager that has a lot of opinions about of a lot of things and is really just really wants to express it but doesn't have any actual real knowledge about any of the opinions that they are sharing. They just have a lot of opinions and emotions and they want to say something. Narratively and logically, it's completely stupid, but emotionally and entertainment-wise, it's quite good. Nonetheless, though, this book really does feel like filler mostly, with everything going back to how it was by the end of the first book, well, plus Lewis being there, moving on into the plot of the third one. And small spoiler for the third book, the third book feels a lot more like what the second book plot-wise could've, perhaps should've been, but we needed this this part to, um, I guess explore more of the lore of Keen, introduce Jordan, give White Raven more screen time just for it to be squandered? Yeah. So overall, I'd say the first book is definitely a bit more interesting as a whole. But with that being said, what of the third novel? The third being the longest of the batch, no less. Will its extra length come with a far grander tale? Well, let's find out together, shall we? And 
And that is it, ladies and gentlemen, for the second part of the Linkar retrospective, and, well, covering the second novel as a whole. Originally, I had a plan to cover all three of the sequels in one big video sequel to the first part, but then by the time I got to the last book, um, like the fourth one, but also the third one, I realized I had a lot to say about every one of these novels. Um, and I figured it might be better to just release these one by one in quick succession so you can kind of have the whole, well, thing out faster, rather than it all at once. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed this video and this narrative journey through the Cassandra Conflict. Both the third and fourth novel videos will be coming out very soon, most likely this month should everything go to plan. Also, little quick update, the Newgrounds Iceberg is being still worked on. I don't know if I have mentioned this publicly other than through my Patreon and channel membership news, but I ended up making my own Newgrounds Iceberg instead of following any set one out because I wanted uh, one that encompassed more of the website than any of the other ones provided. And if you're familiar with some of my icebergs, like the Creepypasta one or the Backrooms one, where I incorporate more story into the iceberg parts between the entries and parts, well, this one's going to have the most amount of story and is going to have full-on animatics to go alongside it, which if you would like to see some previews and behind-the-scenes stuff regarding the production of that, again, you can join my Patreon or channel memberships. For that reason, it's taking a little bit longer than expected, but have no doubt that it's going to be one of the biggest and most ambitious icebergs that I've ever made. Thank you all so much for your patience, and I hope you look forward to not only that, but several of the other video projects and surprises I have set out for the next several months for you. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of my loyal patrons and channel members, including all of my night eggs and night owlets, as well as a very special thank you to all of my great night owls, including Hexmaniac Hannah, Icy Man, and Ho Hot, as well as a super duper special thank you to all of my arch owls, including the wise Nicodemus, the talented Cherry and GT, the good chi vibe Zen Garden Party, the daring Daniel Petrie, the mysterious Mr. Gaming Sheep, the fearless Forgotten Ace, and the Super Saiyan Sword. Thank you all so very much for supporting this channel, and thank you all for watching this video. But until next time, this has been Dylan the Night Owl, flying off.